That concludes our business now. I thank the Minister. And we must now move to questions on education with the Minister for Education. I guess here I'm Sir Kiva Archibald. Call Kiva Archibald. Can call you, um, Question one, please. Thank you, Member, for her question. This obviously is a very important uh, subject. It was highlighted, I think, by the fact that the, it was one of the very early debates within the Assembly, and I know the member opposite was instrumental in, in bringing forward that motion. Climate change should concern us all, and the executive as a whole is committed to tackling it in a new decade, new approach. Signals intention to develop a strategy to address immediate and longer-term impacts. Education plays a critical role in educating our youngest citizens on this subject, and sustainable development is already part of the curriculum uh, at primary level via the world around us and through environmental and society, uh, area, uh, society area of learning at Key Stage 3. So pupils during that will explore environmental and climate change, how to exercise environmental stewardship and are helped to develop an understanding of the need for environmental change to be sustainable. Pupils can gain an understanding of the interdependence of society, the economy and the environment, develop respect for the needs uh, of present and future generations and the importance of securing a sustainable environment. Pupils also have the opportunity to pursue qualifications at Key Stage 4 and Post 16 that explicitly cover issues relevant to climate change. The curriculum itself is designed to be adaptable and dynamic. It devolves a great deal of autonomy to schools and trusts the professionalism of teachers. The aim is to lift the burden of prescription and allow space for innovative approaches to learning. The Council for Curriculum um, Examinations and Assessment supports this by developing curricular resources for schools and teachers, including resources that cover issues like climate change. And of course, there's always more that can be done. And my department will be working alongside the rest of the executive to develop that climate change strategy. I thank the Minister for his response. Um, obviously, young people have been to the fore in the activism highlighting the climate emergency and should be commended for that. But does the Minister agree that we need to harness and encourage that? Um, while respecting the need for flexibility and the devolution of certain um, abilities to schools and setting their, their um, own curriculum uh, priorities, that there does need to be um, evidence and science-based education as part of that on the causes of the climate emergency and the impact on all of our lives? Which is possible, and particularly when we're talking about science issues, that it is always evidence-based. Um, I think from the point of view of the uh, the curriculum, I suppose I'd make two points. I do have a great deal of faith in our schools and our teachers to be able to use that autonomy in a wise way, and I don't think it's particularly my role to impose uh, upon them. Indeed, I, I suppose there is a restriction that I would be under, indeed, any education minister is under, which I think is the right restriction, which I think specifically under the 2006 order, for example, um, any ministers are specifically barred from. Um, indicating to schools a particular time frame that they need to set aside for particular subjects. Uh, so that is supposed to try to ensure that there isn't that sort of micromanagement or interference. And I think it's right that actually we have evidence-based teaching rather than any level of an attempt um, by uh, any minister of whatever description to try to impose what they believe to be uh, important in terms of the micromanagement of the curriculum. I think the important thing is to ensure both that there is the opportunities that are there for our pupils, but also then that schools are not simply left out in their own, which is why it is important that the role of CCEA in terms of developing uh, materials, because it is also the case that uh, while there may well be particular teachers and schools that feel very passionately about particular subjects, they don't in and of themselves possess the, the expertise to be able to draw down uh, their own materials. So therefore, it's important, if you like, that that bank of materials that is evidence-based, science-based and expertise-based is available to them. Call Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, uh, and I thank the Minister for his uh, answers so far on this uh, important issue. Could I ask the Minister if he has any plans to actually convert the school estate to more sustainable energy sources? As, as indicated as part of the overall process, uh, be working with the executive to see uh, whatever wider context we can uh, prevail upon. But I suppose my department already invests in a wide range of measures to reduce carbon emissions within the school estate. 
and these would include certain efficiency measures, um, such uh, as boiler replacement installation, installation of, of uh, LED lighting, provision of energy monitors, and installing solar panels, as well as encouraging sustainable lifestyles and travel. And while these were important first steps, I think that as we work in the cross-departmental uh, Future Generations Group, that will seek to address climate change and mitigate its, its, its impact. And those, of course, are over and above the individual actions that a range of schools take. And so, for instance, we've seen quite a number of schools embracing uh, the uh, Echo Schools um, uh, sort of, and getting that, uh, that flag of indication that, that they are environmentally friendly. So I think we need to encourage that and provide that level of support where possible. Paul, Jim Allister. Would the Minister also agree that it's important, particularly with um, people of an impressionable age, to debunk uh, the hysteria that attends this subject and indeed to deal with the, uh, the tendency towards anarchy among, for example, the Extinction Rebellion protests and that it is very important that when our children are dealing with the subject that they deal with it in a balanced way that eco-fascists don't put their view upon them uh, and that people who would lead you, for example, into the, the anarchy of Extinction Rebellion are properly addressed as an example not to be followed. Um, I think there might have been a number of questions there that uh, the Minister can choose to answer. Whichever. The gamut of questions that have been, that have been put to us. I think in every environment, and I suppose, uh, I'm sure the Deputy Speaker will agree speaking as we are in the Assembly, to avoid anarchy where possible is always a, a useful, um, useful direction of travel. It is important, uh, as indicated to the original uh, questioner, that whenever we see teaching it's done on an evidence basis, it's done on a science basis, and that we tackle these issues in a rational basis. Now, people will have particular passions as, as regards this, but it, it's also important that if we're looking at teaching, that we do so in a way which imparts that information, that evidence, uh, in a balanced and evidential uh, manner. And I think it's important that while people are passionate, that they don't embrace a route which is disruptive to, to others and that we have respect for one another in how we express our views. I call Chris Little. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister what action he has taken to encourage cycle proficiency and safe routes to school to support a modal shift in transport and promote sustainable active travel for children and young people? Well, it is important that uh, the role that home to school transport in particular can play. Uh, I've seen, I think, where particularly schools have worked, and again, it's encouragement where schools have worked with organisations like Sustrans uh, to be able to develop that. At the moment, uh, there is a 84,000 um, pupils each day are involved in home to school transport that is provided uh, by sort of contribution, if you like, from, from school buses. I think where we can encourage um, that greater level of um, mobility that uh, either on foot or cycle, I think every opportunity thinks should be taken to do that. Currently there is a uh, review of home to school transport, I know we'll be coming to it uh, later on, and that looks at how we can actually deliver that aim in terms of reducing uh, emissions. And I mean, there is maybe a certain level of uh, nostalgia in my own thought, but it, would, it is quite clearly not applicable in every case, of going back to my own school days whenever I walked uh, to and from school. Um, I suspect perhaps some of those days may be, may be gone, because uh, as members can appreciate, whenever I was at primary school, it was quite a long time ago. But anything that we can do to encourage, particularly both cycling uh, and walking, um, and I think a healthier lifestyle, both at school level and probably around this chamber, would be one that would be useful if we could all adopt. Here, Mr. Colin McGrath. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Deputy Speaker, and I'll avoid the temptation to comment on the last response. Um, can the Minister outline his department's position on allowing pupils to join future strike movements on climate change, uh, and can he give a guarantee that no pupil will be punished for such? My view is, I mean, look, I, I think it's important that people do express their passions, do express their support for different organisations. I don't want to see people taken out of school to do that. Here, here. I think there's a distinction between what people do outside of school hours, and I think there is a great value in, in expressing that passion with disrupting the, the school day. So it's not something I'd be in favour of. In terms of discipline, ultimately, the, any particular discipline that is applied to a pupil 
at first instances within the school, and I think they've got to draw that, that level of conclusion. You know, I want to see this done in a productive way, one which doesn't disrupt others, and it's supposed to take the uh, leaf out of Mr. Alice Brook in a non-hysterical way across the board, so that we can actually have calm, rational discussions. I mean, these are issues which are very serious to the future, uh, not simply within schools, but in, broadly speaking, in terms of the future of our planet. Uh, and therefore, I think it's got to be tackled in a, in a calm, non-sensationalist way. And as I said, I'm not keen on the situation in which pupils are taken out of school unnecessarily. Call Rachel Woods. Thank you. Um, without going into the previous subject and about the importance of listening to our young people who are leading the way on this and doing uh, a lot of the work that uh, the rest of us aren't, um, and given the urgency, would the Minister agree that climate science and sustainability should be included in teacher training? Well, in terms of the detail of teacher training, again, there will be liaison. Um, there's an unusual situation in terms of teacher training, which is that uh, the role, particularly for the Department of Education, is largely to prescribe the numbers. Uh, then the Department of Economy then produces the financial support for that. And the detail of the curriculum is largely provided by uh, the institutions themselves. You know, I think there needs obviously to be a wide range of things built into that. Again, I'm not going to particularly micromanage to say what precisely should be involved in initial teacher education. Uh, but I think that there is good work to be done between the departments and uh, the teacher institutions in ensuring that, that teachers are prepared fully for the full curriculum that, that, that lies ahead for them. Here I'm Sarah Martina Anderson for your cast. I call Martina Anderson for a question. Going me August, last can call a cast ever at all. Question number two. Number four, her question. My department has made significant investments in the school estate through minor improvement works. Uh, the expenditure in 2016-17 was 66 million. In 2017-18, it was uh, 63.8 million uh, and 84.2 million in 2018-19. And the budget for the current year, in terms of minor works, is 83.2 million, which is suppose, roughly about half of what the overall uh, total is outside of non-ring fenced expenditure. Now, despite the increasing investment in minor works, I think there's significant demand for further improvement remains. So, I think the as we increase the relative expenditure on major works and school enhancement programme over the next five years, that will be an important element of improving the overall health of the estate in the medium to long term. Because it's not, while there can be certain situations where there's a quick fix and is something that is needed very quickly, it's also actually about improving the overall stock of the estate. So I think there's a balance to be struck in terms of the department's capital budget to deal with those immediate minor works pressures and the more strategic investments in major works and SEPs which is anticipated, would, you know, if those are successful, it will reduce the demand for minor works going forward. So my department will continue to bid for additional funding in order to enhance the school estate. And if the member can be of any particular influence on our, our friend, the finance minister, to provide that capital funding, it will be greatly received by the department. Martina Anderson, supplementary question for Martina Anderson. Okay, I want to refer the Minister to what you just said with regards to healthier lifestyle, and I'm sure in your role you know how important that is for children. And in the context of physical health and well-being, um, I would like to particularly ask you about St Joseph Boys School in Derry. Six years ago, they were promised a 3G pitch, and they're still waiting on it. So I'm sure with regards to the funding allocation that you have received, given the implication of the British government austerity cuts here um, on the executive, I can understand how you would be struggling at times and you have to make priorities. But six years ago, they were promised a 3G pitch and they're still waiting on it. So when I say that in the context of physical health and well-being and the importance of that to children. Thank the member for supplementary Specifically, I suppose, in terms of the capital build, uh, I think the one thing that certainly is the case for the Department of Education, as regards our mainstream funding, we make sure that capital is spent, and well, it's a mixture of capital, of the major capital works, the SEPs, and indeed the, uh, the minor works, we will make sure there's the fullest of delivery as possible. On the specifics of, of St Joseph's, um, I'll be happy to look into the, the issue in detail, as a member can probably appreciate, knowing the exact capital position of every school in the country, I wouldn't have that detail necessary to hand, but I, I'll certainly commit to finding out the situation as regards any delays at St Joseph's, and I'll write to the, to the member in connection with that. I call William Humphreys. Thank you, Minister, for his answers so far. The Minister will be aware that uh, in recent weeks, 
officials from his department and the Education Authority have been in front of the committee, and members have expressed concern about the current state of the school's estate in giving a number of exemplars, as I will now in Glenwood in my own constituency in North Belfast. Can I ask the Minister, how much does the department spend annually in terms of maintenance across the school estate in Northern Ireland? Well, as members are saying, there will, I suppose, and sometimes there can be a slightly artificial dividing line between what will then constitute minor works and what counts as maintenance. Uh, I suppose, in terms of the financial pressures, obviously maintenance will come out directly out of the resource budget. Uh, I suppose, in terms of the figures, um, there was 19.4 million invested in 2016-17. For the 16 million, 17-18, uh, the last full financial year of 18-19, there was 20.5 million, and the budget for this year is approximately 18.5 million. In addition to that, there was approximately 90 million of uh, investment in, in minor capital works. Um, now, I think the, with the sort of this sort of cocktail of measures, the aim must be to actually deal with those immediate pressures to ensure that there's a balance between that and then other sort of capital works which are of a, a more major nature. And obviously, to some extent, the more that can be directly invested in terms of major capital works, it eases the burden, particularly in terms of maintenance. Uh, I think from that point of view, there's certainly a belief that, that in terms of the level of maintenance, uh, that there is additional amount that really does need to be found for next year, and certainly I'll be trying to, uh, to do that. Um, and as such, I suppose, uh, there is a large amount of, whenever I think um, we sought sort of a, a range of sort of minor works uh, a number of years ago, there was a very large pool of, of works that was produced, and those were gradually being worked through. But obviously, uh, we've got to ensure that the maintenance takes place at the same time on it. So it's about creating that, that balance or cocktail of mix between the two. Could the Minister um, assure me that, or, or, I suppose give a synopsis, if he has any concerns whether there are schools across Northern Ireland who may be in breach of health and safety standards, fire protection standards, may not be accessible to pupils with disabilities, visiting parents or general staff in the school, and whether he will find a more cost-effective way of delivering the remedial work that is required in those instances. I think, that, I suppose, on two points that the member makes, there is an issue particularly around some of the maintenance work that um, we need to look at where the delegation of budgets lie and give a greater opportunity for um, lower-level procurement, I think, from within the schools themselves. I think that that is, I think, is a very singular thing. And again, I know I think it's a later question uh, which deals with that. In terms of any maintenance work, in terms of any minor works, where there are particular issues of health and safety, and I'm not saying that across the school estate all of these have been solved, those will always jump to the, the front of a queue. Because if there is a le any level of risk uh, to pupils, uh, that obviously has got to come effectively top of the list. And I've seen situations where, indeed, one of the levels of frustration, particularly sometimes for me there in terms of minor works, is that uh, we have a sort of a ranked list, if you like, of minor works from the, the previous call. But that is, and I think rightly so, is subject to change. So if it's identification, then perhaps it is identification of an issue maybe around uh, sort of an electrical issue or something which would have a health and safety bit, that will supersede the, the pre-existing list. And so therefore there will always be uh, an attempt to try and prioritise that. Again, as with other issues, um, you know, there's not unlimited resources, so we can only do uh, as much as we can. But certainly, I think anything which puts any child at risk has to be top of the list. Melissa McHugh, when you cast, call Melissa McHugh when, for a question. The department's ongoing review of home to school transport aims to ensure that the policy is fit for purpose and sustainable over the long term. The review is focusing on uh, the current policy and any changes proposed as a result of that will be subject to full public consultation. Home to school transport plays an important role, not only in supporting the attendance of pupils at schools, but in contributing to a number of wider government policy ends, such as uh, the reduction of air pollution and traffic congestion. Uh, by its nature, and because, for instance, there is a considerable level of reliance on um, organisations like TransLink, this is actually a very much a cross-cutting nature of any issue. And therefore, if there was any proposal for any level of policy changes, that would be brought to the executive. It's not a unilateral matter for the Department of Education. Melissa McHugh. Supplementary question for Melissa McHugh. 
thank you, Minister, for your uh, response. And unfortunately, it was a result of a, probably a, a negative experience on behalf of people who live in the Glenmore and the Manor, uh, area uh, at a time of an amalgamation of schools that stimulates my supplementary. As a representative of that rural constituency, can I ask the Minister to ensure any changes he intends to make to school transport provision meets the needs of rural people and ensure that they are not left disadvantaged? Because that has been the experience to date at a time of amalgamations. Unfortunately, some people have been left out in the cold. Yeah, the member makes a very valid point. I think, first of all, the figures are such that the vast majority, I think off the top of my head, it's around about 67,000. Out of that, 84,000 are pupils transported in rural areas. So any policy proposals, and it may well be that in terms of wider consultation, there's a range of options that are offered uh, in different directions. Um, it's in, uh, that those particularly take account of the, the rural community. I think it's also the case that uh, we need to look that particularly where there are amalgamations, uh, that those are given, if you like, um, sufficient weight and sufficient um, opportunity to, to bed in, because quite often amalgamation will provide a good educational way forward, it will produce a sound economic way forward, but will create particularly levels of um, pressure in terms of finance in the, the first place. And it's important that whatever uh, point that is reached in terms of home to school transport, that schools are clearly accessible to those, those pupils and that the opportunity is given for them to be able to have the fullest of education as a result. Iram Sir Daniel McCrossan, for your case, to call Daniel McCrossan for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm just wondering, uh, has the Minister uh, any plans to review the distances of, uh, uh, required uh, to satisfy school transport? There's quite a number of pupils in my area that just miss out, live in very rural and dangerous uh, parts of the constituency that could not possibly consider walking to school, nor have they any access to any form of transportation. In terms of a wide range at this stage, I suppose there's just a, a series of options, none of which there's any particular conclusion has been drawn on. And I think the overall distance requirement, either sort of uh, in either direction, if you like, is, is one of those I think that's got to be on the table to be looked at. To some extent, um, there is an argument, because I think that the distances that were produced, um, I think were probably produced, I think, maybe in the 1940s. Uh, so there's an argument about whether they are necessarily fit for purpose. Balanced against that must be the, the pressure that is there in terms of the wider... Um, the wider public purse and obviously the impact that it has in terms of, in terms of transport. Uh, it is important that we get that right. And I'm also aware, I think, that the member does highlight a certain level, and it's difficult to find a solution which um, necessarily solves this particular problem. But the member, I think, highlights what is one level of a certain level of unfairness that, that can create problems within communities, which is to say, for example, on the post-primary side of it, that uh, someone who lives... 2.99 miles away from uh, a school has to pay, the family has to pay the full amount. Somebody who lives three miles and 10 metres away from, uh, from that school on the, on the similar basis will get then free transport. And there's, there's a certain level of inequity within that. Finding a solution to that is probably easier than, than stating the, uh, the problem. But quite often you get a circumstance that of two pupils who effectively will get onto the school bus at exactly the same point and they're treated in a different fashion. So I think that there's a wide range of options, and I think that if we reach any public consultation, it will probably be on a wide range of, of options that people can give their, their views. But against the background of what would like to, everybody would like to be done, there will be obviously high levels of financial constraints because this is one of the areas uh, in which it's, it's non-directly related to a school uh, position, but I appreciate the, the level of service that is provided to people. Here, Mr. Heard. Kelly Armstrong. Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister if he can confirm um, what scoping exercise his department may have done uh, with regards to the yellow school buses to see if they can be used by school orga or youth organisations, given the fact that that comes under his remit. I'm very aware that the yellow buses, to be honest, sit doing nothing most weekends, all summers, and during um, holiday periods. There's very little use of those, when in actual fact, 
your department is in charge of, of youth services as well. So I'm just interested to see what scoping exercise has been done to make those vehicles available with driver or without driver to those organisations. As we move forward, as part of a wider home to school transport, uh, looking at interaction particularly with other departments, because this obviously interacts with the Department of Infrastructure. Um, what I would say as well in relation to the use of buses, we do also need to realise that there will be a programme, if you like, of replacement of buses, that um, we're also going to make sure there will be a certain amount of mileage, ultimately, that a bus can produce. And so it's, it's not simply a question of buses lying idle. Uh, there will be a situation in which, um, while we want to make sure there's the maximum usage, uh, that may also have a knock-on effect in terms of uh, the speed with which those buses have to be replaced. So that will also need to be factored in. But I'm open to any, any level of suggestion. I think we do need to see, across transport as a whole, a much more joined-up approach uh, and I know that the, the member has a background, particularly in community transport, uh, and I'm sure she will have uh, detailed thoughts that she wants to share um, in relation to that. I call Morris Bradley for a question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you to the Minister for his answers so far. Can I ask the Minister what improvements are being made to the current uh, service delivery in regard to uh, school transport? Well, Specifically, obviously, particularly the school transport side of things largely lies with the Education Authority. Uh, they're not in the position, I suppose, and haven't been in the position to make particular policy changes, but they've made a range of operational improvements to home to school transport to try and make it more effective uh, and accessible. Particularly, I think, which has been quite successful, the launch of the online eligibility checker tool, which gives parents a much quicker uh, indication of whether their child will be eligible for transport. Uh, parents can now apply online. Indeed, in the current academic year, there were 27,000 applications uh, on that. The authority has also digitalised its, its transport network to improve the accuracy of its eligibility assessments. And as part of the overall position, um, that uh, there's also a uh, part of the Department of Finance's uh, Small Business Research Initiative programme. The EA is piloting a new digital tool to improve safety on board buses allowing pupils, parents and schools to use an online app to track the bus on its journey. So there are a range of those things. I think as part of that as well, there is also I think, a business case that's being considered in terms of replacement of buses, which also will play into the level of modern day and provision that, we can be, that can be made in relation to it. Paul Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In terms of the homeschool transport review, has there been uh, an acknowledgement that the many bus stops are inadequate? There may not be a safe location off-road, and even those serving many villages and hamlets do not have a bus shelter where young people can shelter from the winter storms. So will the minister undertake to uh, engage with other ministers, particularly the infrastructure minister, to see how that can be improved? Any improvements can be made, obviously, in terms of both the layout of roads, in terms of the opportunities for a bus to, to lay off to allow people to disembark or indeed embark, and particularly around issues around bus shelters. To a large extent, obviously, those lie outside the remit of uh, my department, but I'm happy to work with others as we move ahead to see what improvements can be made um, within that. I call Christopher Stalford. Uh, for a brief question. Thank you very much, sir. Question number five. Thank the member for his question, and I acknowledge the continued commitment of professional leadership that is shown by school uh, school leaders. Head teachers, subject to the agreement of their boards of government, gov uh, governors, are afforded considerable levels of autonomy on a day-to-day -day basis. This mainly covers responsibility for internal organisation, management, discipline of their schools, and including the implementation of the school development plans. So. The, they also have uh, autonomy in areas of workforce management, such as uh, managing absence and timetabling. I think that from that point of view, um, I am open to seeing where there can be other measures to increase autonomy. Um, there has been, I suppose, whenever that has been rooted in the past, a, a mixed bag of responses sometimes from, from uh, school principals. But I think there is a good case to ensure that, particularly around uh, issues of minor procurement, for instance, uh, that there could be a, a more relaxed regime which enables, if you like, delivery on the ground. And again, it's part of an overall position of, of putting trust uh, within the professionalism of our, of our teaching workforce. I have time for a very brief supplementary. Very brief. I'm very grateful, Mr Deputy Speaker. As regards to financial deregulation and management, uh, the Minister mentioned um, small procurement, and that is particularly an issue here. 
Uh, how do we compare with other UK regions? Um, England and Wales are very similar to ourselves at present. The Republic of Ireland has a much more centralised system, and Scotland, which is not part of the same local management style, funding reforms, um, therefore funding arrangements have a much greater level of, of central control. But I think we need to actually develop what is appropriate to, to our own needs. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to the 15 minutes of topical questions. I guess Eirim, Sir Melissa McHugh. When you cast, I call Melissa McHugh. Uh, I read, uh, the Minister might be aware of a report produced by the Right to Education Group in June 2019. This report found that 92% of teachers felt that transfer testing had a significant negative impact on the health of children. In the light of this, can I ask the Minister of Education if he will consider his position on the use of academic selection in schools? Minister. Well, I think, as, as Yogi Bear once said, it's déjà vu all over again. Uh, boo boo. Uh, what we are left with is a situation in terms of, and there will be. There is no doubt that there isn't a level of consensus around academic selection. And that has been both at an academic level, at a political level, and I'm keen that we don't simply disappear down that, that level of rabbit hole. I, I've indicated that I am supportive both of the right of schools to use academic selection and of academic selection. The reason I say that is because, again, if you compare with uh, England, what we do see is a situation where selection will happen because there will be always schools that are oversubscribed. But if we see that what happens in some of our neighbours, the alternative that they employ is a section of the school population which is effectively private education, where selection happens very much by the ability to pay. And indeed, we've seen many prominent figures uh, in neighbouring jurisdictions who have benefited from that private education, but that is because their parents are in a wealthier position. Whatever the situation in terms of the flaws that are there with academic selection, I think to replace it with a system, which I think inevitably would happen, uh, with a greater emphasis on ability to pay, is something I think would be a retrograde step, both in terms of academic achievement and also in terms of social mobility. I'd agree with you too that uh, if it was based on uh, the uh, on we'll see just how well off a person was in terms of the type of school that, that they should go to, that that of any way in, in every respect should be confronted. But the UN Committee on the Rights of Children, the Quality Commission, Human Rights Commission, Children's Commissioner, OECD, the Trade Union Movement have all called for an end to school academic selection. Is the Minister content? to see the continued use of academic selection in schools and the light of evidence against it. Again, I have indicated that you not only need to look at where we are today, but where the position would be if we did not have academic selection. I, I, I am tempted to say, having from the last question time, to say I, I refer the member to the answer I gave to John O'Dowd uh, a fortnight ago. Uh, you know, the reality is that, that um, and I note that uh, the member has, has won that, at least in the, the first point, that he does not want to see a system which is driven by ability to pay. Inevitably, if we simply remove academic selection, that is what will happen, because we have seen it happen in other jurisdictions. Whether that is in, uh, across in England, where around about 7 per cent of the school population attends public schools, again on the basis of, of uh, the ability of their parents to pay for that, or indeed a range of private schools in the Republic of Ireland. Whatever is said about the current system, I think we have a fairer system here. So, in short, uh, I'm not seeking to change uh, the idea of academic selection. If there are measures that can be taken that can make that uh, a smoother process, uh, that can make it a more less stressful process, I think that that is something that, that, that we need to uh, embrace. But you know, clearly, and. We are now, I think it is perhaps, um, I think over a decade since the official tests were abolished, and we're seeing more children going through transfer tests and academic selection. So there is clearly a desire out there for it. And I think we've got to accept that reality, irrespective of what particular point we are in the, the argument on academic selection. Yeah. Captain Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister, for, for your response. Um, Minister, I was going to ask her about, I'm sure that you are aware of the statistics that's been released about the reliance 
on uh, cars to get the pupils to and from schools. Uh, they were just released there quite r recently. And I'm just going to ask the Minister what plans he has to try and alleviate those that live within a mile or two miles from the school gates. Well, look, I think it is in terms of transport to schools. And I think there is an ongoing problem, which I think is also then strikes in terms of the, um, the use of transport to schools, which then can create a high level of disruptive quality um, for a lot of the neighbours of schools. And I think that, that is an ongoing problem. I know at various stages that has tried to be solved within individual schools. Some have taken a, a tougher regime than, than others. Unfortunately, it has tended to be a, a situation sometimes where there's a short-term relief, which, is then end, which then only lasts for a while, and then, again, people will, will encroach on that. I think if there are measures which, in terms of the wider uh, situation, in terms of home-to-school transport, and perhaps working with organisations, we can encourage more pupils either to walk or cycle to school. I think that that will help to ease the, the burden. But it is understandable that many parents will, will take a view of they want to take their child to school in a car, and no amount of dissuading, I think, seems to have a particular impact on them. supplementary question for Pat Thank you. Um, I'm sure the Minister will agree with me if you let me move off for a second. But in mind of what happens this Saturday, on the date of this Saturday, there's many relationship that's been struck up at school. And I'm looking at the glances back and forward across the floor. So everyone that's single, be careful. It's a leap. Uh, it's the, the leap year on this Thursday on the 29th. But uh, no, on a serious note, um, um, uh, will, the minister, uh, will the Minister be aware of the necessary prohibited rules for receiving uh, free school transport? Will the Minister be addressing them specifically to allow more students to avail of this service and therefore cut down on the reliance of the motor car? What I would say is, I think, first of all, I think if we can encourage as much as possible that home to school. I, I, I should say, I'm sure the member is aware that uh, he mentions the significance of this, uh, of the, the date at the end of this month. Um, it's clear that, shall we say, the production of children is not dependent upon marriage proposals. And on that basis, uh, I'm sure the member will be very much aware of that. Uh, can I say in all seriousness, I think that the, in terms of home to school transport, it is about balancing what is availability in terms of that transport with the level of public cost. And given that there's a finite budget for education, if, for example, we were all minded to say, well, actually, let us increase the eligibility to a much greater extent to increase the amount of money that's spent on home to school transport, largely speaking, that will come ultimately at the expense either directly from school budgets or as a level of opportunity cost for school budgets. And so consequently, uh, that has to be borne in mind in terms of any particular discussion that takes place. Whenever a point is reached in terms of proposals on home to school transport, uh, those will be out for public consultation. But it may well be that whenever that is done, it is done in a fairly open-ended way so that we would actually look at either uh, particular ways in which perhaps the availability is either increased or decreased. But again, these are cross-cutting issues as well, and it does have a level of impact, particularly on the Department for Infrastructure. Aaron, sir, Liz Kimmons, for your uh, Liz Kimmons for a question. Um, just like to ask the Minister to outline his plans for reviewing the definition of socially disadvantaged, which is used in the application process for the allocation of preschool places. Well, I understand that. I mean, there's at the moment a degree of disjoint. Um, in which I think there's, there's both a longer term and a short term uh, situation. So we'll be looking at, particularly since the introduction of universal credit, that has created this level of mismatch. And so I think uh, we're examining whether then regulations need to be brought in place, which will actually then bring that into line and how that can be done. In the longer run, particularly in terms of the preschool placement, um, there is overall with a new, uh, new deal, uh, new decade, new approach, uh, a commitment in terms of widening the availability of childcare, particularly for three to four year olds. At the moment where there's a situation in which around about 62% of those who avail uh, of that preschool place are in part-time settings. I think that we ease a lot of the problem if we can then move to a situation in which whatever has been made is made on a much more universal basis. Uh, and as such, that I think will inevitably lead to a considerable increase in the overall offer that can be made, the increase in the number of places that are available. And to, the, to some extent, that will also have a role in, in, in the longer run in alleviating that to ensure that everybody is on a level playing field. Liz Kimmons. 
uh, supplementary for Liz Cummins. Government Hoggett, and thank the Minister for his response. Um, but as you'll be aware, people in receipt of benefits, such as contribution based employment support allowance and tax credits, don't currently qualify as socially disadvantaged under the pre application. Uh, Preschool application process. So, I'd just like to ask Minister, will he consider this um, when reviewing the, pr the process and take this into account um, going forward? Well, again, as indicated, I think that there is a, an indication which is not what is there is not fit for purpose in terms of a level of mismatch. I will look at in terms of the criteria. I would indicate as well that there is also to be a balance to be struck again on the basis that if criteria is simply considerably widened, that will also have a large financial implication, and all these things are interdependent and will be dependent as well upon the budget that is available. But given the fact that I think where we are at present in terms of the qualifiers and what is there in terms of the benefit system do not align with each other, at the very least there needs to be a greater level of alignment, which I suspect will require some form of uh, change in terms of regulations. Call Paula Bradley for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, can he explain why Lee Green Primary Referral Unit in Newton Abbey has ceased uh, providing its much-needed services um, for children? Well, I'm aware of the very good work that's been done in terms of Lee Green and particularly in terms of uh, dealing with challenging behaviour. Um, it is actually around, and I know one of the previous questioners had mentioned the issue about health and safety. It's actually a health and safety issue that's been raised. The exterior of the mobile classrooms was in a very poor state of repairs, with sections of the outer partition of the building damaged by storms. So there was, uh, as part of a um, remedial work which was undertaken by the EA, a further health and safety reports in 2019, which identified additional issues. And in order to support children who have been referred to these provisions, the EA um, has provided additional in-school resources as a temporary measure. Uh, to date, obviously, uh, they are not taking any additional referrals, but if we don't have buildings which are absolutely fit for purpose in terms of health and safety, as opposed to... I have often been at schools where uh, what is provided is not ideal, but certainly would meet health and safety. But if there are health and safety issues, then I think those have got to be actually taken into account in terms of the provision that, that we make, particularly for children with special educational needs. Supplementary, Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer? It certainly answers some questions that uh, local teachers have had. Um, I, I, I know of the, of the unit that was stuck onto the side of Glengormley Youth Centre for many years. Um, I, can I just suggest to him if they, uh, if they are looking for a suitable location, he could maybe look no further than Rathcoe Primary School um, to uh, recite this? Well, from that point of view, in terms of there will clearly be a replacement that will be produced uh, for that. I mean, the Education Authority has got the direct responsibility in terms of deciding the location of that. And obviously, we'll be looking at the wider interests of the area around, particularly Newton Abbey, Ballyclare, Glen Gormley, uh, Carrick Fergus uh, area to see what will actually service that. So it's not a question of that um, this is simply something that has disappeared. There will be a replacement put in place. Uh, and from that point of view, I suppose they are examining what will be the most suitable site. And I'm sure they'll take on board the suggestion of Rathcoole, as indeed other sites to see what is best suited to be able to provide this vital support for children with behavioural needs. Call Roy Beggs for a question. <coughs> Minister, in a recent answer to my written question, the Minister has provided statistics on school attendance by ward, which can be as high as 43 per cent of post-primary school pupils having less than 85 per cent attendance at school. Does the Minister accept that this is unacceptable and that those pupils uh, will suffer from educational under-attainment? Truancy is an issue which I think we do need to tackle. The Department has, um, for example, is very much trying to indicate the value of education and the importance of school attendance. That's been part of the campaigns that are there. Uh, I suppose whenever you drill down and to the individual wards, that can produce relatively small numbers, creating uh, a particularly high percentage on that basis. But it's undoubtedly the case that what we're seeing uh, is while the overall system, uh, attendance overall is good, and that indeed there is levels of academic success, we also have areas, pockets of, of underachievement. And clearly attendance at school is a, is a key element within that. Uh, and so while we look and see whatever measures can be taken in the short term, there's also as part of the uh, agreement a panel that will be established looking at education underachievement. And I think attendance at school will be a key element at, at looking at that. Quick supplementary, Mr. Bake. Would the Minister acknowledge that it takes 
uh, the school, the parent and the community to educate the child and that when there are such high levels of poor attendance it often shows that there are problems not just at school and will he liaise with educational welfare, schools and indeed local councils in terms of their community plan to try and raise this issue in the importance of all the community? I agree with the member that I think that in terms of issues around attendance and also underachievement lie beyond, holistically beyond simply the classroom. And so therefore, where we've seen actually elements of good practice, we've seen it particularly in parts of Belfast, where this happened, it has been where that interconnection is there between the school community, the wider community and the parental community. And I think that trying to build that nexus is, is, is critical. I think there are examples of good practice, and I think that's one of the things we need to, to ensure that we can roll out and get that understanding within that so we can start to tackle those pockets where there is that level of underachievement. Thank the Minister. Time's now up. If members take their ease, please.